Furthermore, since the company had not yet worked out how they would incorporate enslaved people into Dutch colonial society, that would come later. The enslaved were often able to negotiate to improve their position. They were able to own property, to sue Europeans in court, to petition the West India Company for wages that they thought were their due, and even to hire Europeans to work for them. They could also be married and have their children baptized in the Dutch Reformed Church. During Keith's war with the Indians in the early 1640s, a group of them, possibly taking advantage of the company's concern that they might join the Native Americans in revolt, petitioned Keith for their freedom, which he granted to them but conditionally. They had to work for the company when asked, pay an annual fee, and tragically their children would not be free. Those who achieved this half freedom were also given grants of land along the Bowery, outside the city to support themselves and their families. Later, in the face of the Esopus Wars in the 1650s, they were able to negotiate for their complete freedom. For over a generation, this community served as a landmark on the landscape for people, European, Native American, and African alike, traveling overland into and out of the city. The Africans' position began to change in the 1640s as the European population began to grow. The colony became more attractive to European immigrants when the company removed its monopoly of the fur trade, keeps war to a close, and unemployment was at home, with the end of the war with Spain in 1648. Then Europeans began to come to stay, and New Netherlands began its transformation from an exploitative to a settler colony. Furthermore, when the company lost Brazil and its slave market there in the sugar plantations in 1654, it began to look around for other markets to sell its slaves. They made Curaçao into a slave depot, and both company and privately owned ships began to import slaves to New Amsterdam from the Caribbean, and occasionally from Africa. All in all, at least 400 captives arrived in New Amsterdam between 1660 and 1664. Although some of them may have been resold in the English colonies, most of them apparently stayed here. It was during this period that many slaves came to be privately owned. Men worked as laborers in many different kinds of projects. They also fought with the Europeans in several of the Indian wars, while women probably performed housework. As I mentioned, though we don't have reliable figures, one scholar has said that at the time of the English takeover in 1664, African num Africans numbered around 500 in the colony as a whole. And we do have one measure of the extent to which slave owning permeated society in New Amsterdam at the end of the later period. One out of eight of the Europeans listed on the tax list for 1665 in the young city owned slaves. And these were not only the city's wealthiest merchants, over half of them were of the Middle East sort and included tavern keepers, mariners, artisans, and even a butcher. New Netherlands had been transformed from a society with slaves to a slave society. As I mentioned before, I was concerned that the presence of the Africans had been marginalized in the story of New Netherlands, and I thought it might be possible to use archaeology to catch glimpses of them and their ways of life. I began by thinking about where historical documents suggested that we might be able to see their presence in the archaeological record. I thought about their different living arrangements with an eye for determining whether or not any of the places they had lived could have survived as archaeological sites. Some of those who were owned and worked for the company lived in barracks, and the locations of a couple of these barracks are mentioned in the records. In the 1630s, some of the company's Africans were reported to have lived outside of New Amsterdam in separate quarters in Indian, company, in Indian territory up near 74th Street and York Avenue. And unfortunately, I don't have a pointer, but for those of you who know the East River, you can see Roosevelt Island, and just to the north, or the uh, above Roosevelt Island and the mainland, there's an F. And that is where the, uh, the slave quarters are marked on the Manitou's map detail. That we, that, we have, uh, that we have here. Today, the blocks east, east of York Avenue at 74th Street consist of garages as well as a Con Edison steam plant. You can see that in the lower, uh, lower right-hand corner. If the barracks ended up being covered with buildings like garages with shallower no basements, traces of the barracks might have survived. It's something to bear in mind when that part of the city is redeveloped. However, it should be noted that these barracks that are apparently mentioned only once in the historical documents on this map. 
They may be apocryphal, or they may have served as temporary housing while the Africans were working on a project nearby during the period when the map was being drawn. Later on, there were barracks in the heart of New Amsterdam. In the 1640s and 50s, at least some of the company's Africans lived together in a house on South William Street. Uh, you can see where the East River is, you can see where the canal is and what is now Broad Street. Uh, if you move up three blocks from the East River, the second building from the left is the, uh, the slave house, and this is from the Castello Plan. And in the lower right is what that site, unfortunately, looks like today. This site today is covered by a large 20th century building, 75 Broad Street. If that building had, has a shallow basement, something which I haven't checked yet, I have to admit. However, it does seem unlikely given the building size, so I have to say you never know. Traces of the barracks and of the people who lived in them may have survived beneath the basement floor. The Africans who achieved semi-freedom in the 1640s were given land along the Bowery just outside the city where they lived on farms. Their farms extended from Grand Street north to 8th Street. The dark line on this map outlines uh, most of, not completely all, of the land that was granted to the Africans in the, uh, in the 1640s. You can see it's quite a bit. As I said before, from Grand Street all the way up to 8th Street. There have been a few excavations in this area, most recently in association with the ongoing redesign of Washington Square Park, as well as others done in association with development projects along the Bowery. But no traces of the African presence have been found there yet, although this area is very promising. Unfortunately, it is not clear from any of the documents that I'm aware of where the Africans, ha Africans' houses were located on these relatively large pieces of land. So it is hard to know exactly where to look for their remains. The final group of Africans that I considered were those from the later period who were leased or owned by private individuals. They usually lived with the Europeans who leased or owned them. In order to look for traces of their presence, I decided to look back through the archaeological collections from excavations that had already been completed to see if I could find evidence of an African presence in these European homes. I was guided in my search by work that archaeologists have recently done in the South, both in the slave quarters on the plantations and in urban areas like Annapolis, Maryland, and Williamsburg, Virginia. There, archaeologists have been able to identify artifacts associated with African life. They found these artifacts in cash pits, in spaces over which Africans had some control, such as the cabins in the quarters where they lived on the plantations, and the kitchens and laundries of the European houses where they worked in southern cities. In the quarters, they found underground pits that were used for storing a variety of objects, ranging from food remains and personal valuables, as well as artifacts that were used in rituals associated with traditional African and African-American spiritual life. Some caches were put in the ground as part of the rituals themselves. Spirit caches that were used in rituals were also found in the kitchens and other rooms of urban houses. There, they were placed in key locations, in the northeast corner of rooms, under hearths, under thresholds, and at the bottom of stairs, by religious specialists to direct spirits, protect, diagnose, and foretell. The artifacts found in these spirit caches include discs, including buttons, coins, and ceramic shirts, roughly shaped in circles, bones, quartz crystals, and pieces of glass, cowrie shells, glass beads, especially blue ones, Native American stone tools, black pebbles, marbles, items with cross-shaped designs, hair, dolls or doll parts, blue painted white ceramic shirts, and objects made out of metal, including pins, locks, keys, and nails. And these uh, have been uh, compiled from three of the houses, three of the caches that were uncovered by Mark Leone in Annapolis over the last 10 years or so. 